Welcome to the Triage Method podcast with me, Gary McGowan, and my co-host, Mr. Patrick Farrell. Patty, how are you this week? As per usual, Gary, I am absolutely phenomenal. It has been a great week so far. It's Monday. We usually record this on a Sunday, but you know, we were a bit busy yesterday. It was the old uh, Valentine's Day, um, which if you live in Dublin, I would definitely recommend going and seeing where St. Valentine is buried. It's quite enjoyable. Um, I always point it out to you, Gary, whenever we're in town. So you should know where that is. Um, yes, but it's beyond my 5K at the moment, so oh, I'm afraid. Oh, yes, of course, of course, of course. I forgot we're still in an arbitrary lockdown of kilometers, you know? Why is it not six, Gary? Could it have been six? Could it have been three? You hate to see it. I saw someone on Twitter say it should only be two. They should reduce it. I was like, fuck you, man. Please, two. <laughs> Absolutely reckless. Anyway, well, <laughs> we're not going to change that situation. And none of that is clearly guided by science. And realistically, we want to talk about stuff that is potentially guided by science. <laughs> However, that's not going to be discussed in this episode. This episode is more of a discussion um, around basically three separate topics that are very much interrelated. And the, the three topics are diet culture, Right. And we're not going to dive every like extremely deep into that today. We just want to, you know, bring that up, bring that to let it bubble up to the awareness, to the, the awareness level right now. Um, but the main stuff we want to talk about today is fat shaming and fit shaming, right? And like fat shaming gets a lot more airtime um, than fit shaming, but they're both very important concepts to understand especially as we continue this series on obesity, because this is something that from either side of the spectrum, um, you have to deal with both of these things, right? It's not just like, oh, if you are overweight, obese, you only deal with fat shaming. No, if you're overweight, obese, you could also deal with fit shaming. And that can be a significant barrier to actually healthful you know, practices, et cetera, right? Um, and the same vice versa, you know? Um, And on top of that, like there is a a peripheral topic, which we might get into today. We might get into in another podcast and that's kind of health shaming. It's an undercurrent throughout this whole discussion um, as we go through this. But anyway, look, we'll get stuck into it. So Gary, can you just give us a little bit of a primer on diet culture? Like what is diet culture? Yes. So for, for me, when I think about diet culture, I don't think of it in the same concrete way that people often think of it when they discuss it. Because what you'll often hear is people say things like, oh, this is the fault of diet culture. And what that effectively does is it takes a problem that's been identified and it attributes it to a rather vague um, cause. And it also takes responsibility off the individual from claiming any responsibility for maybe causing some of those problems or being a part of it. And that's the thing that I think is actually really important here is that like culture is somewhat of an emergent property. And you could say like, it's not something that's necessarily planned from the top down. Like no one came around. There wasn't one day where everyone decided, yeah, this is how, what diet culture is and how we're going to put it together. But rather it's something that emerges within particular social conditions. It might vary depending on your class, for example, your social class, Um, And also is going to vary depending on the country that you live in and the circles you expose yourself to online, etc. So what diet culture is means something different to many different individuals. But if you were to, you know, read people talking about it on social media, typically there's going to be some things uh, included in diet culture, such as the assumption that that everyone should pursue weight loss. I think that's a fair one. Um, Also lots of generally poor diet practices, I think, Um, the idea of certain foods being inherently unhealthful, um, things like uh, detoxes and lots of supplementation, um, lots of stuff that we would consider to be within the non-evidence-based bracket as it relates to weight loss. Um, And then also, I guess you could say, elevating the thin or lean ideal um, to a standard that everyone uh, should hold and assuming that is um, good 100% of the time. Okay, so there's some of the things that I would consider within that realm. And the reason we want to bring that up for discussion is because there's some things you could say about diet culture uh, that might be 
positive or the result of positive intentions. So for example, if someone is um, putting out advice uh, for people to lose fat, to lose fat in a more effective manner, are they promoting diet culture? In some ways, yes, because they're giving advice that's related to diet and they're reinforcing the desires of people who have been affected by diet, diet culture. But they're also facilitating something that is going to be positive for the health of many individuals should they have success um, with those pursuits. So I think that's probably where we diverge from some of the uh, more critical um, analyses of diet culture, you know, people who, who generally just blame diet culture for everything and, and generally adopt more of an anti-diet approach is that I think like in general, we would be, you know, in, in favor of um, fat loss as being something that's generally helpful for a lot of people. However, uh, that that's not always the case and that there are certainly much better practices um, than those that many people engage in. And also um, on that note, that the someone's body doesn't inherently tell you about their current health status, their current mental health, um, how they're feeling about their body, etc. cetera. Um, and as a result, while we can get some information about one's health from things like body mass index, or even just looking at someone, like you can get some information. Um, we recognize that that is merely an entry point and there shouldn't be um, a wholehearted assumption of the, the, the person's health. So that would be some of the, the things that come to mind for me initially. Yeah, and this is this is something that's it's so hard to navigate the 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 situation that we're in, where you basically, like you said, you want to look more holistically at the the individual in front of you, right? Like you want to say, like what, like where are you mentally? Where are you physically? Where are your actual health markers? Where are all the all these different metrics? And how do we combine all those metrics that we have some data on to actually an analyze? Uh, analyze you know whether you are in a healthful position and whether we need to engage in certain habits certain whatever right and and it can be very much a case that especially in like social media and that kind of realm and like i say social media like it's probably actually realistically worse in like traditional media like social media gets a bad rap but like traditional media like newspapers and stuff man they're actually probably worse for it. Like on Facebook, for example, if you wanted to run an, an ad and you wanted to, I don't know, talk about fat loss, like you quite can't actually say fat loss, yeah. you know, like you can't make any claims about like this product is going to help with fat loss or whatever. However, like in a newspaper, they could literally just hire a columnist that this is going to be blasted out to however many people and talk absolute fucking nonsense, absolute fucking waffle about fat loss. That could be the most toxic thoughts thought processes on fat loss you know but it still gets blasted out you know so like even though social media gets a bad rap and you know rightly so in a lot of cases like the traditional newsprint media probably far worse and it's the same with like you know the news or whatever like it's all sensationalism it's all like it's not a rational discussion it's all about clickbait effectively like what's going to get you to keep watching this or click into this article whatever right so we're in a situation where People are being fed such poor information. And I do all the consultation calls when people want to work with us, right? And obviously, Brian has only recently started with us. Um, but this is something that we've also worked with a lot of individuals on. Um, but I bring up Brian in particular because he works with a lot of people with disordered eating patterns and you know issues around their relationship with food, right? And I could not tell you the amount of consultation calls I've been on where we're not really talking about macros. We're not really talking about calories. We're not doing any stuff like that. We're actually just talking about an individual in front of us that could be in a healthful position. Like I literally was talking to an individual the other day, like by all objective measures, if you went on their Instagram, you'd be like, this individual is in a lean position. You know, they, they seem to be exercising. They seem to be engaging in healthful habits. But when we actually talked about their goals, talked about where they, what they're doing, where they have been, like all that kind of stuff, digging a little bit, even just scratching under the surface, we realize that this individual has really poor confidence in themselves, right? Really low confidence in their ability to handle their nutrition. Like they, they feel like nutrition is in control of them rather than them being in control of nutrition, right? And all these other myriad of things, I'm not going to get into at all, but like all these other things that, you know, if you just see social media and you see this person, you know, looking jacked, looking shredded, looking whatever, like you don't know the full story 
behind that right and that's just from an emotional perspective because like i'm not dealing with like blood work or whatever um over a consultation call here and um, you know to see if someone wants to work with us and um, well that might be something that we do in a coaching can uh perspective or as part of the co coaching process like we're not doing that on a consultation call to see if you know we're going to work together however even just from the emotional side like the the the, the mindset the lifestyle stuff and um, these individuals are not in a great place a, a lot of the time right and even though they are objectively you know they're lean they're fit whatever that's not telling you the whole story and further to that like I've seen the blood work of a lot of individuals that you know, have phenomenal physiques, next level physiques. And you'd look at them and be like, Jesus, like, man, you need to get these blood markers under control. You know, like, I don't know, C-reactive protein, for example, like we'll say it's a marker of inflammation, could be in a terrible position, right? And we know inflammation, not really a great thing for health overall, especially if it's chronic inf inflammation, right? But then also you look at like their blood lipids and all of a sudden you start seeing it's like, oh, your LDL is, you know, pretty damn high overall triglycerides pretty high and oh your hdl pretty low like we're not in a good position even though you're like yeah man look at my six pack you know and they're just like really easy like biomarkers that we can look at so the reason i bring that all up is because we have this idea that first of all an individual just if they're lean they're going to be naturally healthier and to an extent that is the case they're definitely going to be in a metabolically healthier position if we look at a population you know if we look at a population and again we use that categorization of bmi which we've discussed is not perfect by a long shot however if we again just use that to stratify the different populations and look at different classifications within that bmi like as a population if you're in these lower weight categories or these lower bmi categories unless we're getting down into the very low ones like you might be in a better position with your overall health like your metabolic health basically if you're not in that overweight and obese category like we can probably say as a generic you're probably going to be in better health. However, that's not the full story. And we really have to take into account the overall life of that individual more holistically, like what's their mental health like? What's their uh, living situation like? What's their lifestyle like? What are their general diet practices like? What are their exercise patterns like? You know, what are their relationships like with other individuals? What's their community like? You know, do they have a community? Are they an isolated individual? Like, what's the story? What's their spirituality like? You know, all those kind of things, they do all play into this. And like, some of them are just not, you know, it's, you're not going to be able to objectively measure your spirituality or your connection with others or whatever. Like, like you're not going to be able to measure that. Like, yeah, okay, you could say like Facebook friends or something is a, a good measure of connectivity, but like ultimately that's not, you know, that's not telling you the whole story. You could be talking to a hundred people per day and still feel lonely. Like people say that, like they'll literally be in a room full of hundreds of people and still feel as lonely as being on their own, you know? So like what I'm saying is that I'm just tying it back to this kind of diet culture, like, there's a lot that they get right when they talk about diet culture and a lot of the stuff that you know, these people that are, we'll say anti-diet, like they've identified some really key points. However, the reaction to that, in our opinion, at least is not always consistent. And that comes back to their experience with diet culture. Right. And generally, again, going back to like the social media and the, the news print media, whatever, um, generally the diet culture is not like an evidence-based diet culture it's not like they were engaging in good practices to begin with it's not like they were engaging in healthful practices to begin with no the diet culture that they've been exposed to uh, forgetting about like the the actual culture stuff around it the diet paradigm that they've been exposed to is like yo-yo dieting right and the archetypical example of this is like uh females who are exposed to especially on like social media or whatever where people talk about their nutrition as purely black and white. You know, it's like I'm either on my diet or I'm off my diet. There's no in between where, you know, they're just trying to maintain their results and eat healthily. No, it's like I'm either gunning for fat loss or I'm eating everything around me. And then I have to, again, start gunning for fat loss. You know, it's like, there's, there's no in between. It's very dichotomous, very black and white. And the overall, picture of the the diet that you get is not a sustainable diet model you know and for a lot of individuals it never actually produces results right they they, they follow this diet model they end up end up with like binge eating patterns so they destroy their overall relationship with food and they don't actually get results so they, they feel like they're putting in so much work to the diet and then not getting results at the back end of that so they're in the worst of all worlds like it's a, a lose-lose situation or 
they get results, right? They're able to stick to this chicken and broccoli diet paradigm, you know, this nutrient deficient model of dieting that seems to be, you know, what people get exposed to. And so they get results in terms of, you know, they get the leaner physique, but they've not, they haven't laid down any, you know, sustainable practices, no uh, sustainable habits. They don't have a good foundation of that diet. The only way they know how to be on track with their diet is to basically eat fucking sawdust and chicken breasts. You know, it's like, this is not, that's not something like they don't know how to eat out with friends. They don't know how to eat out with family. They don't know how to navigate all these different situations that they're going to be exposed to. So inherently, because they have a, let's call it what it is, a shit diet model, right? They're going to have a shit relationship with that diet model. And they're going to have a very, very colored opinion on dieting as a whole, because the only way they've ever done it is what we would call like bad dieting. You know, like that's, that's what it is. Like, let's call a spade a spade. Like you didn't diet correctly. You got shit results at the end of it. And like, this is true. No fault of your own. I'm not saying that, you know, this is your problem. This is you, you, it's all because of you, you know, I'm just saying that what you were exposed to was not good, sustainable diet practices, you know, like there's a way to do things right. And there's a way to do things wrong. And the way I see a lot of times people talking about like this backlash to diet culture and this anti-diet rhetoric, it stems from them not having done it correctly in the first place, you know, and this is almost like, you know, you have your maths homework and you do your maths homework and you do it completely wrong. And your teacher's like, this is wrong. And then all of a sudden you're like, yeah, maths is shit. Maths doesn't work. You know, it's, it's not the maths that doesn't work. You just did it wrong. You know, again, that's because you don't have the resources, you don't have the tools and you don't have the knowledge to do it right. And again, a hundred percent. And this is where they get so much information, right? They can clearly identify that the reason you do it wrong is because of what your environment is like, what your social situation is like, what your socioeconomic situation is like, and all these other things that feed into your ability to actually, you know, do it right, if you will, you know, and it is so hard to really as an individual who's, you know, maybe not, you know, whatever involved in this stuff. It's so hard to get this right and get the information that you need because you're, you're in this place where you're just being fed lies oftentimes, or you're being sold a, a dream oftentimes, but you're not actually ever achieving that dream because people are just trying to make a quick book off you. They're just trying to make, you know, oh, here's another sucker that, you know, we are actually just going to rope into this diet culture. I'm going to give you a shit diet model. I'm going to not get you results, but that's great because ultimately you're going to stay on my books then. You're going to be with us for the next 10 years because we have you on this merry-go-round where you binge eat and you don't get results and, you know, you're always yo-yo dieting and like you're on this merry-go-round and there's so much mental real estate being taken up in your mind with all this stuff that you know the diet industry has got you hook line and sinker now because you've basically stepped on the merry-go-round and they've kept you on the merry-go-round you know and that's not a position that you want to be in long term right now i'm sure you have some things to add to that gary but i do want to also say that we will probably talk about diet culture in more depth in another episode and probably get someone on that's far more qualified, at least in, in their thoughts to uh, talk about this stuff. Um, but I do want to move the conversation on to this discussion around fat shaming and fit shaming. So what are your thoughts so far on what I've said there, Gary? And let's move the conversation on to fat shaming, I suppose, first. Yeah, I'll just move it on because as you can guess, I agree with what you've said. Um, so when it comes to, to fat shaming, th this is something that's really important because like the way I look at um, this kind of problem, if you will, and the thing is, we're, we're talking about a problem that may not have been identified by some listeners before. So when we're talking about uh, th this kind of problem of anti-diet versus diet culture, like that's basically an argument or a pendulum swing that goes on online where, you know, people will identify problems with diet culture and then maybe they'll adopt more of an anti-diet approach where they push back against the whole thing. But that pendulum can also swing back where people on the other side might start to say, oh, well, you know what? We actually should be shaming fat people because it's a bad thing and we shame smokers, so we should shame fat people. Um, and that's not a good thing, okay? That's just before, just before we go on to actually like yeah. identifying that, like you can understand the thought process, yeah. right? And again, you go, okay, smoking causes cancer, causes all these health issues, bad for you know the people around you, et cetera, 
right? And then you go, okay, let's look at the, the health outcomes associated with obesity, overweight. And you're like, oh, these are pretty bad health outcomes. These are a drain on resources for, you know, especially in countries with like socialized medicine, et cetera. So you can understand how there is a, a connection here where you know, logically you could go, okay, let's jump from this and go, if we do, we shame smokers. And that seemed to have worked. Again, not understanding the actual bigger picture around how we kind of got people to stop smoking. Yeah. Um, and that seemed to have worked. So why don't we do the same with fat people like that? If it worked here in this other context, surely it should work here in this context, which also has these health issues uh, associated with it. You know, So again, like you can look at it logically, maybe not with the full picture and make that connection, make that jump that shame is a good way to deal with this issue. Yeah. And, and the problem there is like, as you correctly alluded to that, the reason that smoking rates have generally gone down or the reasons are far more complex than shame. You know, many of them have to do with the fact that you were actually prohibited to smoke in the areas where people most often smoke, like pubs and restaurants, for example, um, and other things related to obviously the restriction of sales and advertising and taxes, etc. So many different things. Um, and that's a single behavior. Obesity is actually far more complex because it's actually an emergent outcome as the result of all of these other factors. So it's, it's, it's certainly complex. And the thing you have to get when it comes to shame is that when someone is shamed, what does that actually do to them? It's basically a, it has a neurobiological effect in that it is a stressor. And as a result, it basically puts the person in a physiological state that you generally wouldn't want someone in if they were going to be um, successful with a diet in the first place, you know, or if they were going to improve their health. So shame is something that is generally negative um, for one's mental health and physical health to some degree. So simply shaming someone and expecting that to improve their health probably isn't a great way forward. You know, um, if you think about how you felt when someone has shamed you in the past, it's rarely something positive. And if you think about the role that, f the role that food often plays in our lives, um, particularly if you're someone with chronic obesity and potentially um, dysregulated um, satiety cues or hunger cues, if you're someone who, you know, you, your normal coping mechanism for stress, for example, one of those is to go to food, then if, you're, if someone is shamed, then what are they going to do? They're likely to, you know, try and comfort themselves in some way. And that might be in the form of food. So, you know, we're, while it may seem logical, as you say, we're not necessarily accomplishing what we want. And that, that shame can go a bit further as well. Um, it's broader um, in the form of, of weight stigma is what people would refer to it as. And again, this is something that has repercussions that aren't often clear um, if you haven't thought about it. Because one thing might be, for example, if a patient has gone to their GP and their GP has said, you know, uh, oh, no wonder you are uh, having these symptoms. Sure, look at your weight. You know, that's an act of shaming. It's not particularly compassionate, but bit more important than that and more fundamental than that, um, putting the, the shame and the niceties aside, it's fundamentally like medical malpractice in some way, you could say, because you're not actually going through the process of thorough diagnosis because you're associating the person's symptoms with their weight. And, and that's where you actually encounter a fundamental like diagnostic problem that can occur uh, within medicine. And that's something that happens with uh, weight, but it also happens with many other things. Like if, if doctors are trying to diagnose a disease, sometimes what can happen is you anchor uh, based on the first thing that came into your mind. It might be the first diagnosis that came to mind or the patient had a particular uh, appearance that looked like a disease that you're familiar with. Um, and in this case, it might be, oh, you saw that the patient was obese, so that might explain their disease. Um, and all of those things um, can lead to uh, misdiagnosis, delayed care, um, delayed onset of treatment, et cetera, which isn't uh, good for a person's health at all. Um, and, and, and you can even think about like someone, how someone might feel in that situation where they've had that uh, attendance at the GP. Um, they feel like they weren't really listened to, their problems weren't discussed in the way that they should be. 
And then the next time they have some sort of health complaint, they're less likely to seek care. So they're less likely to be engaging even in the, the health behaviors um, or uh, health practices like medication or whatever that might actually be necessary for their health. So there are some of the reasons why we see weight stigma potentially leading to, to worse health outcomes um, because there's both the shame element of it um, and, the, and the psychosocial stress associated with that. And then also um, those elements of, of care itself. So I think that when we tie all that together, what that does not mean, and this is what some people suggest, what this does not mean is that your doctor or personal trainer or whatever, that they shouldn't uh, discuss uh, weight as a, a, a health-related metric or something that might modify health outcomes or that they shouldn't discuss uh, weight loss as a potential therapeutic avenue because you can talk about those things and you can introduce those things and one would hope that you could consider those factors while still you know, going through the diagnostic process um, if you're a doctor or a medical professional. Um, so I think it's, that's, a, that's a really key point is to not throw the baby out with the bathwater there. You know, just because there are some problems um, with weight stigma um, and, and shaming and the way that we communicate um, as it relates to obesity, that doesn't mean that we throw out the evidence that demonstrates that obesity has adverse health consequences and that weight loss although not always successful, can indeed lead to um, improvements in many health outcomes. Yeah, like ultimately we're looking for compassionate care. And for like, sure. like you said there, like it is, it's almost malpractice. Like I would actually consider it malpractice, especially because we do actually have research to suggest that, you know, people that are overweight, obese, whatever, especially if they have a negative uh, encounter at the doctor where the doctor only really focuses on their weight, you know, and um, they're not likely to go back to the doctor. They're not likely to seek medical care in future because they just get shamed with their weight. I'll, I'll tell a story about that now in a second. Well, peripherally to that in a second. Um, and that's, that's something that like, that's not a beneficial position to be in because uh, what we're ultimately trying to do on a population level is to, you know, make the population healthier you know, um, and also from our, our perspective, and like, I mean, like the individuals in that make up that population, we want to lower the burden on our healthcare services, especially if it's socialized medicine. Um, and we also want to make our fellow man healthier and, you know, live better, longer lives. You know, that's, I think most of us are altruistic in that respect. Um, so like having a paradigm where your doctor says, oh, the reason you care about this or the reason you have this issue is because you're fat and they haven't taken the time to dig any deeper into that. You know, they haven't taken any time to realize that, oh no, you're actually down 50 pounds. You're actually significantly improving your health, you know? And all of a sudden now this individual that has had this terrible, well, say terrible uh, event happen to them in the, the, the doctor's office, like they're not likely to seek help in the future. And again, you can think about how bad this would be, especially if we have the context of, we know the diseases uh, related to obesity and overweight um, are slow creeping diseases, right? So like the earlier you can get intervention in there and get in control of those issues, let's take for example, blood pressure, like the, the sooner you can get in control of that, the, the more likely you are going to have positive outcomes. Another one, again, blood cholesterol, like the sooner you can get that under control, the less fucking plaque you're accumulating in your veins and arteries, et cetera. You know, like that's, that's beneficial. So why would we tell someone or another one again, blood glucose, like we don't want that developing into basically diabetes there. And um, by just leaving it uncontrolled, maybe you have it so uncontrolled that, you know, you get some sort of like peripheral neuropathy or something that like, you actually have to get your foot amputated, <laughs> you know? Um, like we don't want to get to that situation. And all of those things, again, we know that those are diseases associated with overweight and obesity. So what we want to do is catch it early. So what we don't want to do is have this individual coming in going, oh yeah, I think, you know, I have this or whatever. And then you go, yeah, it's because you're a fat cunt. Like that's basically what the person hears. That's basically what the individual hears when the doctor says that. And yeah. again, how is that going to help that individual when they're just like, I actually came here for something that I have going on. I'm actually already working on my, my health overall. I'm exercising, I'm eating healthfully. And I have a few th different things going on with um, my relationship with food that you know make me binge eat or whatever as a coping mechanism. And I definitely would like help with that. Like how is any of that being sorted by telling them, oh, you're a fat cunt, that's the reason. Like that's not helpful. That in no shape, way or form is that helpful, you know? And um, so shame is not a good tool right? It's, it is a tool, right? It can be used. And I'll give a two stories here. And one of them I wanted to say a second ago. Um, 
one story is there, there's a one that goes around um, about like, a, I think it was a chef and his friend texted him every single day, like, are you fat bastard or whatever, basically shamed him into losing weight, right? So shame, it works for some people, right? We can't discount that. However, is that the frontline intervention that we use? Like we know, like, I don't know, something like Bud's training or like any like uh, military training works for fat loss. Like all of those lads that do that or women as well and um, that do that, they lose weight, right? Does that mean that that's going to be our first line intervention? Something that we know has a super high attrition rate, something that we know people fail at and, you know, already they, they have a high barrier of entry to get even into that. Like, is that going to be our first line of treatment if someone comes to us and goes, oh yeah, I actually think I want to lose a little bit of fat. Are you doing that? Is that what you program for your fat loss clients, Gary? No, it's fucking not. You know, like we have a more holistic, sustainable approach when we come to that. So how is it the same that, or why is it not the same that, okay, some individuals definitely respond well to shame as a, a cue for, you know, betterment of their health, their physique, whatever, right? That doesn't mean that we're going to implement that on a population wide basis, right? So while this individual, again, I think he was a chef. That's the only thing I really remember with the story. Um, like while it worked for him, that's not something that we're bringing in across the board. Now I'll give you the other story um, and to put into context why this might be the case, right? Like I, I had a, a, an individual that I know will say, um, and like he was sexually abused as a child, right? So like fairly traumatic upbringing in terms of like, he was literally sexually abused as a very young child, right? And the coping mechanism he had developed to help with that was to overeat, to overconsume food, right? Anytime he felt vulnerable, anytime he felt pretty much any emotions that he didn't, like they were, we call them negative emotions, like he turned to food, right? That's what he did. He turned to overcompens or overconsumption of food to fill some sort of void within him, right? So he already had all these feelings of shame, guilt, whatever. Like he basically had like a, you know, survivor's guilt, this kind of like, you know, he had a traumatic event when he was younger and he was in a bad position, a bad way, mentally, et cetera, right? Like, do you think him going into the doctor's, he was overweight, uh, he was actually obese, but anyway, um, do you think him going into the doctor's office and the doctor going, I'll step on the scales there. I know you were complaining about like, I don't know, having headaches and I don't know, vision issues, which anyone would go like, oh, maybe this is a blood pressure issue. Um, you know, he's complaining of these different things. Um, and the doctor goes, oh, step on the scales there. And basically goes, yeah, all your issues there. It's because you're a fat cunt. You know, you need to lose weight, you fat cunt. Like that's, again, just to be very blunt with it, that's effectively what the doctor's saying, right? And do you think that's going to be the best way for this individual who, as soon as they hear it, they feel vulnerable, they already probably feel vulnerable coming to a doctor. You know, maybe the doctor is telling them to take their t-shirt off and, you know, to do whatever. Um, and they, they've literally never shown another human in their life, their fucking bare physique because they were sexually traumatized as a child and they have huge amount of like, we will call it privacy or, you know, intimacy issues around that. And then the doctor says like, yeah, you're a fat cunt, right? Like the individual, the only thing they're going to do at the other end of that is go home, initiate their coping mechanism, which is overconsumption of food and never go to the doctor again. <laughs> you know, like how is that best serving that individual? Right? So while we can definitely cherry pick individuals and go like, well, this individual did really well with a, a shame based uh, approach to uh, uh, habit formation and, you know, body composition and health change. Like we can also cherry pick on the other side and find countless numbers of individuals that that simply would lead to the exact opposite of what we want, you know? So like, in my mind, I just don't see using shame as a, a good tool. It can definitely be a tool. And like, I know like you, for example, would respond really well to it. If I was like, here, you're, you're being fucking shit at this, Gary, you need to fucking, you know, get your shit together. And I was, you know, basically berating you a little bit, like you would resonate with that. But that's because I know you on an individual level as a population, like, do you think I'm going to use that as a tool to help a lot of people? Like, no, it's, it's just not, it's just not a beneficial tool. 100%. And, and I think like most people get that. I think once you, once you've kind of thought through it, but sometimes I, I think, you know, people can, especially people in groups, like people in groups are always different to 
people on their own. Uh, but like, you know, when there's memes online and stuff that maybe are clearly fat shaming or whatever, uh, that, you know, people find that a bit funnier. Um, I remember back when I was in, when I was in UL, I remember there was like uh, a group of girls like sent around, I think a Snapchat of someone who was uh, at, a, at an exercise class who was obese um laughing being like oh my god what are they doing here like which is literally the opposite of what you would want if you're trying to make the case that you were fat shaming for a positive purpose because you're literally someone is there making the effort um so particularly when it comes to those types of things this is actually the next topic we want to get onto which is fat shaming but continue yeah so that that's that's kind of the the transition point i guess is that like you you do never know where like how someone got to where they are as well. And we were talking about it before the podcast where, you know, you might be on, I don't know, on the subway, um, on the bus, whatever. And you look across and you see someone, they're about 300 pounds and they're, you know, stuffing their face with a big massive subway sandwich or whatever. And you're thinking, Oh my God, look at that. Look at that fat person stuff in their face or whatever. But that person could have previously been 400 pounds. They might have just logged their subway into my fitness pal and they're like, oh, yeah, I hit my macros for the day, no problem. Like, you just don't know. You've no idea where someone has come from. And the reality is that, like, if someone is was at 400 pounds and now they're at 300 pounds and um, like they've significantly improved their health and like they've made amazing progress so you you just don't know really um and and that that's also relevant as it as it relates to fit people lean people thinner people whatever you want to say because you just don't know where someone is at and this is the dangerous thing is that what sometimes happens um as a kind of a pushback against um the the diet culture as we said is that you know you'll see people say things like oh you know give more space to people with bigger bodies or oh stop worshiping these skinny people or whatever or oh look at look at her she just said that she feels fat and she's not fat at all like someone could be looking perfectly lean they could be looking so confident in their photos and they could be torn apart inside they might genuinely hate their body they might be so self-conscious more than someone with obesity they might have severe anxiety and depression associated with that they might be binge eating every night and their way of getting some validation to justify their self-worth is to get you know some some feed some likes on instagram because they post a, a photo after the gym you can say that that's not a healthy coping mechanism and it's certainly not but you still don't want to exacerbate that problem by giving that person shit because, you know, they're not um, actually fat and they're saying that they feel fat. So you do just have to have a think about, you know, where people are coming from, what might be going on behind the scenes. Because like, as you said earlier, like you just, you just can't tell from, from, from looking at people, like someone could have severe underlying health issues um, and be, you know, very, very lean. And, and one of the things that, that um that came came up for me a couple of weeks ago was or when we were doing our last Instagram live actually um was someone asked someone actually asked the question they were like Gary you're looking um or have have you they said you look like you lost weight was this intentional um that was what they asked so it wasn't like an immediate compliment it was oh you've had a change in your weight like was there a reason for that and and as it as it um came out or as it turned to be and the reason that I had been losing weight was because I've been struggling with depression and as a result my appetite and and I just haven't my appetite has been compromised and I haven't had much of a desire to to eat in the way that I normally would and for me like I wouldn't take offense if someone had complimented me you know and said you oh you look great because you lost weight because like that just doesn't bother me but I could certainly see how it will bother someone else and it it kind of goes to show you that someone could clear could make the assumption that oh gary you look great you know i wish i was like you or you know i wish i could lose weight as easily as you and stay lean but you actually just don't know what's going on um under the hood so i think just reserving assumptions particularly online is a generally positive thing it can be very hard to do uh because we all want to kind of jump to conclusions you know we all want to assume that other people are really happy or really sad. Um, and sometimes that makes us feel better. But I think generally, if you can be a bit more empathetic to others um, online, I think that also improves your ability to engage with yourself as well, um, I think. So, yeah. 100%. And like this, this is one of those things where it's just so hard to navigate this. 
obviously, as we just discussed, there's this whole concept of like fat shaming, but also in terms of like fit shaming, where you basically are <laughs> oftentimes shaming people who try to get fitter, right? Like you said, in that example there, where you had these girls basically shaming this uh, other individual who went to an exercise class to try to get better. You know, it's like, why would you shame people that are actively trying to live a, a healthy lifestyle? It just doesn't make sense, you know? And the same with, again, like you use the example of this guy just counting his macros, eating the subway, you know? And um, you don't know where he's been and you also don't know where he's going, right? And um, so like shaming people when they're actively doing stuff to get fitter, like it just doesn't, it just doesn't add up right? It just doesn't make sense, right? Like a gym is supposed to be an environment for people to better themselves, whatever their starting point. That starting point could be 400 pounds. That starting point could be 60 pounds. You know, you just don't know. And the same with that as, as well. And you, you touched on it there in terms of people talking about thin, thin privilege, like it just completely invalidates people with eating disorders, like completely yep. invalid. Every time I hear someone say thin privilege, I just think you're a fucking moron. You know, like that's, I literally, that, that's my thought process. Because imagine, again, your daughter or whatever, right? She has an eating disorder where she struggles to keep her weight up, right? Because she, as soon as she gets over, I don't know, 60 kilos on the scales, right? Or 55 or whatever fucking arbitrary number, she gets into these like binge restrict patterns where she restricts down a lot to keep it under that. She barely eats anything. And then because she's so hungry, she ends up binge eating. So her overall diet is, you know, it's in a bad place for her relationship with it, but the actual diet pattern itself is just very, very poor, right? And then she posts a picture online with her friends at the beach or whatever. And someone's like, oh, this is your thin privilege or whatever. Like, how is that like in any way uh, a beneficial thing to do for society, you know? Like, how is, like, that's, it's just, it's just stupid. <laughs> it's just, it's just moronic, <laughs> you know? So every time someone says that, like, you're more than welcome to use the same heuristic I use and just think and that person is a fucking moron or they haven't actually thought this stuff through in, in any intelligent way, right? So as soon as you see those words, thin privilege, and not used in a, like an explanatory context or whatever, like just assume more, right? Because of course, there definitely is a privilege to being thin right? There, there hundred percent is, but that doesn't mean, and, and what I mean by there being a privilege, like it's, you can fit into clothes off the hanger better and whatever else. But then we start getting into this thing where, you know, it's almost like intersectionality where every single one of us has different things that are, you're in different groups, you know, like for example, like I definitely can't buy stuff just off the hanger. Right. And I, like I'm six foot five odd, you know, so like I get extra large trousers, right. And just for the length. But if I get an extra large trousers, like the waistband is going to assume that I'm like a 36, like if I have a 36 leg, which is roughly what I have, right? The only trousers you can get off the rack are like a 36, 36, right? I have a 32 inch waist, you know? So like they're, they're not going to fit me off the rack. Does that mean that I'm not privileged now being a six foot five male and the the beauty standard is like, you know, tall, dark, and handsome, which is, you know, pretty accurate description of me if I say so myself. Um, <laughs> but you know what I mean? It's like, how, how do we overcome that? Because I'm now complaining about the exact same thing that these other individuals are complaining about saying that they can't find stuff just off the rack, you know, and I can't either, right? So are we in the same category now? Do we have the same levels of privilege? Like it's, it's such a murky water uh, environment. And this is also, you talked about this previously, and uh, uh, I think it was on your Instagram a few weeks ago in terms of like this kind of like health privilege uh, discussion. Like you just don't know where someone's health is actually at. And that's from both a obesity, overweight, thin, you know, lean, muscular, whatever. Because again, like health is much more than just like, you know, objective markers on a blood panel. Like we have to consider the actual all those stuff that I talked about at the start of this episode in terms of like your community, in terms of your mental health, in terms of healthful, excuse me, healthful practices, et cetera. Like there's so much more that goes into this that, you know, it's just not really reflective on like, oh, I got my whatever blood test back and it came back normal, you know? Like, and this is one of the things that really annoys me as well when people talk about um, overweight and obesity, you know? They'll be like, oh, well, you know, there is a metabolically healthy obese individuals. And like, that's definitely true to an extent. And we've talked about that before 
it's true to an extent because again over a longer time period it's not really true um overall but also it's like how is it he helpful for an individual if you tell them like they're coming to you and they say i have a really poor relationship with food i have a really poor relationship with myself and you get a blood panel and go yeah look you're metabolically healthy though so it's all good keep going you know like that's not helpful either you know so it's like we have to think more holistically we have to actually look at the individual in front of us and realize that there's a lot more going on and uh, that you know just a blood panel can't you know accurately identify and then also we have to take into account what the individual actually wants you know and what they're actually trying to achieve now just wanting better blood work isn't going to change that you know just going oh, i want that i want that like you still have to engage in the the different habits that will lead to that and um, but this is a, a much larger discussion overall and um, but i do want to just tie it back to that kind of fit shaming and make people hopefully realize that fit shaming is not beneficial either you know and this happens a lot in people who are overweight or obese and um, like and they identify as that and then maybe they start engaging in an exercise uh, program that they like whether it's like a zumba or something they're like yeah like, i really enjoy this and as a result of engaging in habits that they enjoy that are you know healthful habits all of a sudden they lose weight and now they lose their uh, you know status in that community where it's like oh you lost weight you know i thought you were one of us and they basically get shamed for engaging in healthful habits getting fitter getting healthier like that's just not beneficial like at all and this happens like obviously on a celebrity basis we'll say but it also happens in different friend groups where you know you'll be in a friend group that you know everyone in the group is like you know slightly overweight a little bit on the the fatter side of things and then you'll start exercising start eating healthily and basically you just get excluded from the the group where they start fit shaming you because they're like oh, well, you wouldn't eat like this because, or you don't want to come to this event because you like to eat healthily and we just didn't invite you over for pizza because we didn't want to be judged eating this pizza or, you know, oh, we just assumed you'd be exercising or whatever else, you know? And it's like, you can't, like, you basically stop your friends from getting healthier because you have a poor relationship with your own diet, your own body and your own, like, food in general. So, like, fat shaming is bad. Fit shaming is bad. Shame as a concept for change it's just a terrible uh, tool to use yeah and i think in general like if we're if we're talking about that overall relationship with weight, with, between weight and health that you need to make sure that that goes both ways because very often this conversation gets illuminated as it relates to obesity where people start to say oh well you can be healthy um and obese or you know your weight doesn't tell you everything about your health but it's also really important to remember that as well when you're talking about the like lower body weights because as you said people will, the same people who make those cases will often argue for things like thin privilege then and and just it it just misses the boat so much like you don't you just don't know like that person could have had cancer like what, what privilege do they have you know they just had cancer or they might have depression and they can't eat as a result of it or another mental health disorder they might be suffering from um bulimia anorexia nervosa any number of health conditions that could potentially lead to that person being at a lower body weight um so i think that's it's just such an important point that like this goes in general like don't get so caught up in identity and or identity politics that you forget your compassion and empathy for other people because this is is really what hap what happens most often um and i think that like both of us would probably be in favor of, of treating people as individuals and respecting them as such. And that goes for people like you. It goes for people that are not like you. And it also goes for people who don't necessarily share your beliefs. And in this case, whether someone is um, obese or with a BMI of 50 or they're underweight with a BMI of 15, you can absolutely start with some, um, minor predictions, for example, about what that what health issues that person might be dealing with or what their weight might say about their health, but you can't make a, a, a an assumption or a diagnosis other than based on purely size. Um, so yeah, just just assume that people might have other shit going on that you're not aware of. And I think that makes you probably a better person. Yeah, and I just want to wrap this up basically on two, well, one statement and a question. Um, and the statement is like, you, you actually said this before, and um, like your body should be the least important thing about you. Yes, sir. You know? Like that's, I think that's a good, again, heuristic to just use and realize that 
you are more than just this meat vehicle we use, you know, like you are more than that. Right. Um, but then also just to finish up on this conversation of like fat shaming and fit shaming, um, I'll give you uh, an anecdote of uh, someone that we know um, a few years ago, they were at a, an event and um, a, a lady at the event said to them, they'd consider that they were you know, hundred odd kilos jacked out of their mind, you know, veins everywhere. Um, uh, individual lean at the time as well um, and you know very la- vascular etc and just wearing a t-shirt right and the the lady come up to him, came up to them and said like oh i would hate to look like you i would never want to have like you know bulging arms like that veins coming out of everywhere like it's, it's disgusting you know and in response that individual then said like yeah i'd hate to look like you as well like fat bulging out of everywhere like your arms are disgusting it's horrible you know and i just want to pose that as a question like was either of them right or were they both wrong or were they both right you know and if you think one or other of those was right try to actually argue that from like first principles because neither of those two things are we'll call them the uh the standard or the ideal you know like being extra vascular and extra jacked well like guys who go to the gym like that like the vast majority of the population would be like oh that's that's too much you know and so if you think that it's all like the, the the guy was in the wrong there like actually try to argue that from first principles like try to argue that from like a baseline like it'd be very hard to say either of them were right or either of them were wrong in that situation so i just want you to ponder that when you are thinking about this this conversation of like fit shaming and fat shaming yes sir anyway that covers everything it does um so how's life gary life is um fine <laughs> the average is it it's gonna be my stock answer from now on uh, just fine uh it's still too easy of course in the sense that we're staying on the path as always Mm. I know a lot of people have been wondering how you are, especially because like we haven't really talked about it too much on the podcast in terms of how you're getting on. So I know people are wondering about that. Um, but also I know like it's still early days for you. So I don't want to be like, yeah, tell everyone your story, tell everyone what's going on. <laughs> um, yeah, no, well, we're, we're on the way up. I think um, people were very kind on the old Instagram with their questions and our comments and, compliments and all that um which is kind of double-edged because uh, one of the things that you should know about depression is that someone complimenting you just feels totally empty it's it's, it's kind of nice but it's at the same time it's like yeah i know you're saying all these nice things but you know i still hate myself so um that's quite Rash, nice rationally i can look at this and be like yeah rationally very nice, very nice words that you're putting they there. are very nice words so <laughs> They are still sincerely um, appreciated. You're all very kind. Um, but yeah, no, I'm, I'm on the way up. I'm just about to go and do some training after this. And that's going to be productive. And college is fine at the moment because I'm on a clinical practice and research block. So our, our placements are all messed up because of COVID, basically. So I am in college tomorrow for like two hours. That's all I have in the college. Everything else is kind of very self-directed at the moment. And then I'm due to be in Tralee Hospital next month, which probably won't happen, I think. We'll see. I'll probably know next week. But other than that, um, we're just tipping away at triage. We're, you know, taking on clients as always, as people know. So I'm keeping busy. And just actually on that, you actually had a good uh, uh, health shaming, health assumption dm the other day about yes. your, your your mental health so i would like to hear that perspective again well i'd like the listeners to hear that perspective yeah it came up a couple of times and and one one in particular you know one of the questions was um it, well i'm just going to paraphrase but effectively you know someone had said um that you know gary like when i look at your instagram or whatever or i followed you for so long and you know you're you're fit, you're lean, you know, you're a good looking guy. Thank you very much. Um, you know, you seem to do well in college. You've got passion for all these things that you're doing. You know, you train, blah, 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 whatever else. Um, how could you have depression? Like, why would you think you have depression? Um, and that's really relevant, obviously, to this conversation because, you know, you're just assuming that 
what people present online um, is, or even in real, in, in real life, very much in my case as well, um, is, is what's going on under the hood. So yeah, just, I think there's a good lesson in there that you shouldn't always, you know, just assume. Um, and obviously that's also my responsibility, you know, to <laughs> not continuously uh, say that, you know, life is fantastic if it's not. So there's a lesson there too. Mm-hmm. It's still too easy though. Still, well, I will never change my perspective on that. <laughs> we will still move forward. But that actually is something that um, my sister actually brought up when we were talking about depression. She was like... You should also know because she is a psychologist. Yes. Yeah. So, she, so she was wondering, um, you know, what's, then why do you keep saying, like, why do, you, why do you stand by this too easy mindset or whatever? And like my answer there is like, right. So if I've got depression, um, there's the, the general tendency with, with depression is... I just want to curl up in a ball and sit in the corner and smack my head against the wall because I don't want to do anything. Um, Or I could try to override that by saying, you know what? Um, I may as well move forward with some self-efficacy and try to accomplish things, feel useful, and hopefully that will be helpful. I think that's generally a better approach. So (laughs) I think that keeping myself nourished psychologically with with a mindset that's a bit empowering is definitely better um, than simply adopting the more kind of victim type of approach so that's my perspective ultimately ultimately, like realistically if you've been getting all this shit done and you've had depression that only validates the fact that it quite literally is too easy (laughs) like you literally have severe crippling depression and you're still getting shit done so that can only mean it's too easy easy. (laughs) (laughs) anyway yeah you know you know but i should actually just add there by the way that um look for people listening that like different people do have different experiences with depression. So if you're someone who's like, has, you know, severe fatigue and inability to do anything because of your depression, that's not necessarily a bad reflection on you or anything, you know, it does vary considerably. So just in case people are are obviously being a bit like, they just, yeah, we're trying to be joking, you know, be facetious. Um, anyway, Gary, um, where can people find us? We have coaching spaces available. So can you tell the, the people about that? Yeah, we do have coaching spaces available. And to be honest, um, they've been filling up. You know, we've, um, despite COVID and gyms and everything, you know, we've had quite a few um, new clients. 2021 has been going very well in that sense. So uh, what I would say is, you know, if you've got goals for the summer, I think, you know, February, March time is generally around the period of time people start to think about those things. And I think that another thing as it relates to coaching is that, you know, we have had a couple of clients who, you know, have said uh, initially that they're like, oh, you know, I'm just going to wait until the gyms reopen. And (laughs) even if you're not considering coaching, if you're in that mindset as it relates to your goals in general, just get going on them, you know, get, get working because you can't guarantee when the gyms are going to be open. And ultimately like there's a non-zero chance that, there could literally be another novel pathogen introduced that could put us in a much more severe situation with the pandemic. So (laughs) get fit, get healthy as best as you can. I think that's, that's a very good choice. Um, So yeah, if you are interested in guidance towards that, we do offer full comprehensive online coaching in the form of training and nutrition. And then we do also have nutrition only online coaching. That's a very popular service at the moment because obviously people have far more control over their nutrition than they do over their training with gym be- gyms being closed. Um, so if you do want a space for that, I definitely encourage you to inquire soon because we will have to close spaces soon. Um, so all the info is in the description box below, but you can also feel free to reach out to any of us individually, myself, Patty or Brian, um, or, or triage at info at triage or on the old Instagram. If you want to just drop us a message. Um, other than that, as you know, we do have a membership site and um, we're going to be um, starting to really increase the, the production of content on there as well. Now the coaches corner, a um, few things been going on behind the scenes and we've been, we've been working on some stuff so that that content production will be ramping up again. Uh, so if you're a coach yourself, you want to improve your education, you want to get on board with anatomy, physiology, all that sort of stuff, practical coaching stuff, you can join the coaches corner. We do also have a newsletter, the triage method newsletter, which you can subscribe to. Um, and you can also join the triage method community, which is our free open access Facebook group. We welcome questions and all that good stuff in there. We do post on social media as well. So follow us at triage method. You can also follow myself at skinny gaz at 
the real Paddy Farrell for Paddy and Brian O'Hengisa at Brian O'Hengisa. Very, very simple. We're definitely um, going to get him to change his name though, because who can spell that? I know it's too complicated. Um, so yeah, you can find us in all of on all of those places and share the podcast. It's always very much appreciated when people share it. It's nice to know that people are listening, um, and it also helps uh, spread the good word of the triage to other people. Yes, I have nothing else to say from that. Um, I hope people enjoyed this, and as you said, Gary, I hope they follow along either on our socials or just even on uh, Spotify or wherever you are listening to you podcasts or youtube even um and other than that again it's too easy it's too easy